Well. Jennifer. Hey, it's the Luscos. I don't know how to add <laughs> to, subtract from, or improve on that. So I'm just going to say hello. Hello. You say hello. I say I goodbye. I say goodbye. You say hello. Goodbye. goodbye. I say hello. Hello, hello. Hello, hello. Very nice. I don't know why you say goodbye. I say hello. <laughs> oh, 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 oh. <laughs> Good job. You're welcome. Uh, okay, so that's actually a sweet thing with Beatles songs. So Olivia... The other day we were listening to a, a little playlist she put together and she had Beatles and I was like, mm. oh, that's sweet. She was like, oh yeah, I remember so clearly when I was seven and Lenya was five and dad would bring us into the little guest room and like basically have us sit there and listen Exposure to therapy. Beatles songs. Yep. And she said she remembers that. She doesn't remember a lot about that time, but she remembers that very specifically. I would like to say it this way. As a parent, I feel an enormous responsibility to bring my children up in the way they should go, because the Bible says when they were when they were older, they will not depart from it, and a big part of that has been uh, imparting to them a love of good music, yeah. which I cannot speak higher of music than I can say Beatles. <laughs> now, worship songs certainly, yes, uh, but as far as just all around, like that Olivia loves the Beach Boys and uh, and the Beatles, and uh, I'm not going to continue on. I'm going to, some people are going to be like, wow, how dare you let your kids listen to Bach, you know, the other <laughs> stuff I make them listen to. But, you know, I think it's really, oh, really cool. Beach Boys, Jenny, Bach, this has Beethoven, been, Beatles. <laughs> yeah, all, all the things. Okay, so this is a wonderful start to our season two of this podcast. Oh my gosh, we're in season two. Season dose. And we're trying to start the year off with some episodes that are centered around getting better and improvement in different ways. And, uh, you know, just experiencing the fun of bettering ourselves in 2021. <laughs> <laughs> Did you like that? I just came up with that. I like you just like side eyed me. Like, did yeah, you get it? Yeah, did you yeah, get yeah, it? Did, did you like you it? it? Did you like it? Ooh, <laughs> ooh, that's a shoulder dance moment. <laughs> shoulder dance moment. Twenty twenty one. Uh, and one of the areas that can really hamstring us is uh, our finances. Yeah. And when we're, when our money's out of control, it can really cause our entire lives to be out of control. And that's because money is so connected to your soul yep. in ways that it's just even hard to fathom. Right? Right. I mean, I know when we got married, I brought credit card debt. You had some... Unawareness. You know, unawareness. And, and it, <laughs> I had no debt because I didn't know. Well, and it got out of control and we, it really brought, it put a, a darkness on our, on our marriage yeah. and, and a weight yeah, that we were unnecessarily true. swimming with. And one of the things that, uh, among others, really helped us to get in control and to come to a place of being the head, not the tail, like the Bible says, is uh, our interaction with the the Ramsey, um, you know, uh, Empire. Empire. <laughs> That's a wrong way to say it. <laughs> with family. Dave Ramsey's ministry, ministry family, <laughs> and uh, and then really quickly, and we talk about this um, is 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 Dave's daughter who is so special and yeah. so spunky and so fun. Her name's Rachel Cruz, and she is God has really raised her up as a leading voice, yes. carrying that message of, uh, of Financial Peace University and just all of that way of doing things yeah. into the future and, and, and carrying it into a new generation. And so Rachel Cruz is uh, our guest on this episode, and she uh, is a best-selling author of three different books. Her newest, Know Yourself, Know Your Money, which I highly recommend yeah. uh, to families, to, to people who are married, going to be married, young people. This is a, a really a paradigm-shifting book. Yeah, we talk about her first book, um, Smart. Smart Kids, Smart Money. Smart Kids, Smart Money. And that really impacted us, and that's... Huge. She co-wrote that one with her dad, Dave. Yeah. Um, the other one's Love Your Life, Not Theirs, also impactful. So I would definitely say you, you need to, um, I mean, know yourself, know your money, I feel like is life-changing and will help you know not just the your money situation, but why you do what you do and who you are and what you were brought up with. It's so helpful. So I'm, this, this, this interview, this conversation yep. was so powerful. Yeah. Getting to sit down and talk to her. And I think, you know, here we are in this new year 
And a lot of people are probably still paying off some of the Christmas presents they bought on the credit card. And mm. so to think about, uh, hey, man, what, what could help me get ahead this year in all that God has for me? And hey I man. think, hey, man, hey, man, <laughs> hey, man, hey, man, I need to <laughs> Hey man, Sorry. hey man, give me that, give me that pot, uh, that pot. No, no, that's a jar. I want a pot. Hand me that. No, I'm no. Put some money in no, it. No, the woman to handle on it. <laughs> <laughs> hand me that. Hand me that double-handed pot. What the pot with two hands? Hey yeah, man. double-handed pot. <laughs> hand me that. Hand me that pot pie. The woman the chicken chunks in it. Oh my gosh. You want a you want a you want a pot pie? I thought you wanted a double-handed pot. I want you to put that put that to put a pot pot pie in that <laughs> double-handed pot. Hand me that. Him and that pot pie pot. Oh <laughs> my gosh. <laughs> Just Levi, no, you go. both your hands put that. Him and that. Him and that. Him and that. Him and that. I'm very sad that I it's the remix. mocked him. Him and that. 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 Him and Sorry. Oh, All right, without further ado. <laughs> Hey, and thank you for listening to this. Thank you that you would carve time out of your day, that you could be doing anything. You could be playing darts. You could be playing snooker. You could Maybe be... Maybe you're doing those things and listening. That's that true. Is multitasking, a skill. which I like. I'm a, I'm a big fan of. Multitasking. Am I? Yes. Well, you're just a fan of efficiency. Mm. So if you can do something and another thing at the same time, I think that you would do it. So while you're listening you're to this podcast... Well. Hand me that pot pie. <laughs> All right. This is our conversation with, with Rachel, Rachel Cruz. Cruz. Well, Rachel Cruz, thanks for jumping on Hazel Thank you. Absolutely. Thanks for having me on, you guys. I so appreciate it. Yeah, it's really amazing. Um, we have been a fan of yours um, since Smart Money, Smart Kids. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. <laughs> We'll talk a little bit about the story of the new book, which is amazing and all the things. But uh, Jenny and I uh, were going through Glacier Park with our kids. We live up by it. And in the, in the summertime, you got to get out there and do yeah. all that kind of stuff. And I remember like, OK, it's a long drive. We're going to be in the car forever. Let's get this book. We put the Audible on and I wasn't prepared for how much I would be impacted by the book overall that you and your dad did together, yeah. but specifically by the stinking rope analogy. <laughs> that If that didn't just become a formative part of our family, yeah. I mean, I remember crying the first time I, we had kind of really talked around it and, and you mm -hmm. telling that emotional story of your dad handing you the rope. Oh my um, gosh. And then, you know, I Life told changing. it to our church and I feel like it comes up in conversations with my, our daughter's 15, our oldest daughter. We have five kids and she's the oldest and how often we talk about more rope, less rope. And mm. so thank you. So good. I love that. Well, it's such a good word picture, right? Even for kids and stuff. I'm like, yes, I, yeah, it, it's so tangible. Totally. Yeah, so, so helpful in our lives. So for thank those you. who aren't listening, you get a little bit of rope handed to you if for good behavior <laughs> and for a little rope taken away from bad behavior. But tell just the story of when you finally got married or was it when you moved off to college? Yeah, when I went to college. Yes. Yeah. It's so interesting because the rope, again, we talked about it all the time, right? Like, oh yeah, I got caught in the eighth grade going to the movie I wasn't supposed to go to with my friends, you know, and it's like the rope's going to be pulled back in, Rachel. Or you do something well and it's like, okay, yeah, we can give you a little bit more rope. It's the trusting aspect. The more we have your trust, the more responsibility you can have to make your own decisions in life. And so the night before I went to college and my older sister, she experienced it first. So I kind of knew what was coming. Um, but yeah, he had this rope with all these different ribbons tied around it, symbolizing all these different parts of our lives, everything from our spiritual walk to our purity, to our academics. I mean, everything that you're responsible for is in college. And, and it was a gift that you literally unwrap and it's a rope and he hands the rope and he's like, okay, my rope doesn't reach from Nashville to Knoxville, Tennessee. And you're, you're responsible now. And so it's that, it's that level. And it was, again, it was such a good tangible word picture, even as a, as a 13 year old, you know, of like, okay, what decision am I going to make? Cause am I going to earn the trust so that I can have the freedom that I want? Right. And I can gain that level of maturity. So it's, um, I'm so glad you like that. I haven't talked about the rope in so long, you guys. Well, oh you gosh. have to continue to talk about it. If you don't, I'm going to anyway, <laughs> <laughs> but it really is a, just a, such a simple word picture. And I think, I think parents don't really know how to talk 
you know, to the kids about responsibility and trust. Yeah, and so, so and, and when you're saying, Hey, this is something we're going to have to reel a little bit. And my, my daughter say it to us, she'd go, I have a feeling this is going to cost me some rope, but you know what I mean? It's like, <laughs> So it's it's just something so easy for them to have in their heads as well. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's phenomenal. And now this is your third book. So you uh, went from there to love your life and uh, and not theirs. And that some of that comes up in this book too, which is really important. Mm. Uh, and and now uh, we're in 2021, and you have released Know Yourself, Know Your Money, which they got you sitting Indian style. Or is, are, do they just, call that Indian? Yeah, it's a, it's a little. It's a little interesting pose. I'm just sitting on the floor. I'm just sitting on the floor is all I know. Sitting on the floor. Yeah. Did, we had the photographer <laughs> selling that to you. How'd they like, we, Rachel, we'd love to get a hand on your neck and one on your shin. I know it's gotta be just like perfect. Right. Oh man. Pose. Yeah. And I must say like your smile is beautiful. I was look at, on your Instagram. Like there's so much of your smile and it just brings so much joy. So oh. thank you for that's yeah. Just so for the smile. You know, and it's so interesting because money, it's such an intimidating topic for so many people, right? And it's, and it can be very shameful. There can be a lot of guilt around it. It's such an, it's such an interesting part of our life, money and what it brings and the baggage it has. And so I always try to bring things down low, right? Cookies on the bottom shelf. It's not intimidating. It's not shameful. We can just casually talk about it. So that's my casual pose. Yeah, but <laughs> honestly, it really does work. I mean, I, I, I was making fun of your pose, but uh, I think <laughs> when you read this book, people are going to feel, I think people are going to feel like you're at Applebee's talking over chicken fingers about mm. like, Hey, come on, here's the real deal. Like, you know, you break down those walls and it's not a heady intellectual budgeting book. Cause as your dad says in the forward, and as you come back around to the, the concept that money is about 80% behavior, 20% head knowledge. And so most of the books that are all about head knowledge, it's not really getting to where people are living. That's exactly right. Yeah. It's so interesting to try to be instructional, but yet inspirational with this message. Cause I'm like, I can't just be all inspiration. Like, yeah, just go in and it's, there's no instruction to it. And then if it's all instructional, you'll probably fall asleep. And it's like, okay, I have no inspiration to go out and win. And so mixing the two uh, has been important for me to try to get across because I'm like, I want to affect people's behaviors. I want them to get to a point where they understand what to do. But man, that behavior side, that change is so huge. And that's part of the why I wrote the book because for 10 years, I've talked about the how-to, how to budget, how to get out of debt, how to invest, how, how to be a good steward. What does that even look like to manage your money for God? How to give? But it, that's, such a, that's such a small part of it, that behavior change. And so diving into why, why do I do the things I do? Why do I view money the way I view it? Why are my habits the way they are? And it's, it's a lot. I ended up in this black hole is what it felt like. I'm like, oh my gosh, there's so much here that we haven't really dug out. So that's where the book came from really. You know, it's a deep dive and it's so, so important. But also I think from seeing your Instagram, it would be pizza. Oh, so no chicken fingers? It wouldn't be chicken fingers. It'd be at a good pizza parlor. What do you think I ate today for lunch? What do you think I had While for lunch While watching today? HGTV. And, uh, okay, so that's incredible. What's the best pizza, Rachel Cruz? What is your, oh, if you, like, what's the pizza to rule them all? Okay, so I am not, I, I mean, I love all pizza, but I'm not a Chicago deep dish. Mm. When I go to Chicago, I will, I'll do it. But it's the pie type thing. I'm a New York style all the way. And there's a place actually right near Times Square. So it's very Is this called Sbarro? Michael Scott told us about that. (laughs) (laughs) I am not above that. Okay. By any means, I will eat that for sure. We decided to move to Montana and start our church at Sbarro in the Salt Lake City Airport, which is now gone. So we're not above it either, but special. But which is the New York pizza to you? I know. Well, there's a few of them, a few places, but there's one, it's like on, is it 53rd? I literally, I mean, I go, I go every time I, well, when I went to New York, yeah. besides yeah. 2020, uh, I went, oh, y'all. So I like the thin New York style. Mm. I like a little banana pepper, a little pepperoni, onion, Very green good. pepper. We oh. like the Lombardi's in Soho, which purports to be the oldest pizzeria in the, in the country. And then Grimaldi's uh-huh. right under the shadow of the Brooklyn Bridge. That one's. I've been to Grimaldi's, yes. But they only take cash, which I I don't like cash. I feel like might as well get beads and well, leather pelts out if I, you know. Well, and you're handling cash to, and then you're going to eat. You're going to eat your food with those same hands. Wait, do you pay before you eat? What kind of world are you it's living all, in? It's, it's the whole payment. thing. <laughs> Incredible. Oh, 
love okay, it. Okay, so now you, you talk in the book about um, family of origin, and that is, I think, really important. Like you said, instead of just... Um, you know, coming in, swinging with, here's how to set up your budget. And here's the, you know, you're like, actually, no, you need to understand why you make the decisions that you do. And you're a little bit, I mean, it's almost like, I felt like as I was reading, I was like, am I lying on a couch talking to my psychologist? Because this is me now understanding. And you give a kind of a quadrant of four different types. Explain that a little bit that, that just, I mean, obviously people are going to read it and get a lot more, but just kind of 30,000 foot mm. view. What are those four different views? which have two different sides of, of polar opposites yes. on money. Yeah. yeah, well, money's communicated in two ways in a household. It's communicated emotionally and it's communicated verbally. And so when I was writing the manuscript, I was like, oh, and I thought, oh, it creates a quadrant. I was like, Jesus gave me a graph and I'm so excited about this graph because here it is. And so quadrant number one is the anxious money classroom. So if you grew up in this money classroom, then it was verbally closed and emotionally stressed. So you felt tension around money. You knew there was tension. You probably couldn't pinpoint why exactly, but you knew it was there. Classroom number two is the unstable money classroom. And this is where it's verbally open, but emotionally stressed. So lots of fighting, lots of conflict. You heard it. Probably heard your parents have the same money fight over and over again. All of it. Mm. Uh, classroom number three is the unaware money classroom. And this is where it's verbally closed, but emotionally calm. So not nothing was talked about, but it wasn't there wasn't tension about it. So it was fine. It's just kind of your head was in the sand and that's all you knew. And then classroom number four is definitely the, the healthiest money classroom. And that's the secure money classroom. And this is where it's verbally open and emotionally calm. Mm. So you could have $10 in this classroom, you could have 10 million. The amount of money doesn't matter, but it's the idea that the environment, there's control over the money. There's a plan, you know, what's going on. And also you talk about it. You talk about the tactical side of money, giving, saving, spending, working, investing. You talk about that as a family, but also the emotional side of money, the, the spiritual side, right? What does it look like to truly be a manager and not an owner, uh, to truly look at generosity, to look at contentment, to look at those things in regards to money. But all of that is a conversation that is intentionally talked about. Wow. I can't imagine how helpful this would be for a couple who's dating or engaged to go through this content before yeah. getting married. Oh, tremendous. I mean, money fights and money problems are one of the leading causes of divorce in America today. And what was so interesting, you guys, as I was doing this book, I realized I'm like so many of our life problems masquerade themselves as money problems. Wow. So usually it's it's a debt problem is what it feels like, but really there might be a contentment problem, that there might be a problem that you don't plan well. And so you depend on going into debt for your bills instead of saving up and, wow. and having a plan. Uh, when you and your spouse aren't on the same page and fight about it constantly, it's not a Again, not a money problem. There's probably some marriage stuff there that mm. that has that's happened. So it's just when you can get under that surface. And so for couples, like you said, who are engaged or newly married, when you can start good habits is awesome. But when you can get under the the surface of it all to say, okay, here's why I function the way I do with my here. Are, here's my values. Here's where I lean. Here are my tendencies. And you can get on the same page and have empathy for each other early on. I mean, that I feel like that would change oh, the game. Life changing. Yeah. Now. What's really interesting to me is that you present as you're giving this nexus of all these different classrooms, kind of the dangerous side of all four of them. And you mm. would think there would really only be dangers to the first three. But what I thought was most eye opening, because obviously you have grown up in the home of someone who is, you know, one of the form the foremost authority on um, financially sound generosity and stability and strength. But you even show how kids who grow up in that home like you did, there's a downside and a da not a downside, but a danger to that too. And I thought that was really interesting. Mm, yeah, absolutely. I mean, there can be a level of entitlement that you just leave the house and it's all been taken care of. It's all been good. You understand it, but you think, oh, it'll come easy. It'll be fine. I won't have a struggle with it, you know? Oh man, and that's not true. I mean, you there's a, there's a level of humility you have to have that, yeah, just because your parents were wow. good and smart with money doesn't mean you automatically get that gene. You have to work for that too. And and I learned that, again, even writing this book, it's funny, I know you guys have written multiple books, and so God exposes so much, like, as you're writing, I'm like, I'm talking to myself here. Totally. But even going through 2020, I'm like, I still I still see my unhealthy sides of money, whether I, I lean too much of it on it for security or I spend because I care what people think. I mean, whatever it is, the unhealthy side, I mean, it, it comes up in me. And I grew up in classroom number four, so you're not exempt from not making money mistakes. If you grew up there, you still have to work on it. And you have this quote in the book. Um, I think you're referencing someone else's statement, but you say basically most married couples intermarriage and assume that they're going to be in the first seven years of their life where their parents 
are the home that the financial home their parents were in, but it took them 35 years to get there. And I think that is, I mean, that's mm. really, you just assume like, well, this is where they were. At, and that can kind of be a classroom number four kind of tendency too. Things were so well, we're just going to start out there. Wow. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That was Larry Burkett. He said, we spend the first five to seven years of our marriages trying to abstain the same standard of living as our parents, but it took our parents 30 years to get there. And there's a level of instant gratification there, right? That like, this is the generation specifically, my generation that man, we feel that delayed gratification is not something we practice very well. I mean, our life is so instant from our phones to information we can get, whatever we want, communication, all of it. It's just so fast. Yeah. And we put that into our money habits and that can be dangerous. Right. Gosh. Gosh. And I think you, you could cut off a lot of fights at the past too for, for a newly married or engaged couple to sort of understand. I mean, we talk about somewhat family of origin when it comes to like, to, you know, sex. Did, did sex get discussed or, you know, how did conflict get resolved? But really just understanding, you know, what, what forces shaped you because a lot of these fights, I mean, I mean, I can't tell you how many times in Jenny and I, 17 years of marriage, has there been a financial component to a, a fight yeah. or that provoked it? Yeah. And just to understand ahead of time, this, this is where this is coming from, because yeah. this is how I see the world. So I think that's really the deeper, eye-opening. The deeper situation that this is showing, which is... Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's a real thing for sure. And, and it's interesting, too. People either mirror so much of what their parents did because it's all they know, or they do the exact opposite. You know, I talked to one girl and she said, no, my parents bought us everything and everything looked good from the outside. And it was so appearance driven. And we were a mess as a family. So she told me, she was like, I will drive a Honda Accord for the rest of my life and be okay. She was like, I just, she's so repulsed by it all. And then you talk to other people and their parents were so stingy and cheap, maybe because they had to be, or maybe because they just, that's how they were. And the moment that they got money for the first time, they just go and spend and it's unhealthy. It's too extreme on that side. And they just go because they have this control now of their own money and they just spend it all because they want the freedom. They long for something they never had. So it's just fascinating. And so watching your habits to realize how this formed, either the way I handle money, the way I view money from my parents and my upbringing. Now, another takeaway we got from Smart Money, Smart Kids. And, you know, I know this is, we're talking about this new book, but that one really, uh, it changed how we thought about allowance because I grew up getting an allowance. Jenny, you grew up getting allowance, but yeah. we when we read that book, we, your dad and you said something that made so much. And I love, by the way, how you're. Li, we listened to the audiobook, like I said, mm. and so hearing your dad, hearing you, like so that special. back and forth was very fun. Yeah. But that your dad doesn't. Be, your dad didn't believe in giving an allowance. Talk That's a right. little bit about that, because I think a lot of people that's kind of paradigm shifting because yeah. it's so ingrained in our culture. Oh, yeah. that, you know, this is how it works. Yeah. So we were never given an allowance. We were always on commission. So you work, you get paid. You don't work, you don't get paid. And from early on, I mean, it was, we were the classic family with the chore chart on the refrigerator. And I mean, they did it. We weren't perfect at it by any means, but that consistency for sure was there. And I think it just really is, it's huge for kids. I mean, I have a five-year-old now, our oldest is five, a five, three and one-year-old. So Amelia, our oldest, she's just now really grasping a lot of this. She's like, oh, I can clean my room and make money and I can buy a Polly Pocket and I can, (laughs) you know, she can, she's starting to get it. Love it. But, but your kids, gosh, they give their money differently when they earn it. They spend it differently when they earn it. They save it differently when they earn it. There's a there's a level that they get to um, have their own money that they earned and a level of lessons and, and mistakes that are made, all of it. But they get to experience all that emotion as a kid under your roof and your protection and make really inexpensive money mistakes and learn inexpensive money lessons. Yeah. Versus the first time they ever handle money is the first paycheck they get at 22 years old in their first job and they make a mistake on a car lot. You know, it's you, you they learn it so young and I think that's important. And so are there chores that kids do just because they're part of the family? Absolutely. There can be a level of that for sure. Uh, and do you pay on every little thing? I laugh because I'm like, no, then you create little union workers. And they're like, I picked up, <laughs> yeah. I picked up a sock. Where's my penny? And I'm like, no. Totally. Hold, yes. on a, hold on a second yeah. here. Yeah. Someone's <laughs> got to pay for the food around here. Yeah. yeah that's yeah. it. That's it. So there's a little bit of a balance. But I think you miss so many teachable lessons when you don't pay for anything. No chores. Uh, so paying for a few, it could be five, it could be six, it could be two, whatever you choose as a parent. But having some level of awareness that money comes from work. Yeah. And when I earn it, I have a different emotional connection to it. And you do a really good job in the chapters on and give and and save and um and lit. What's the third one? Live. Yeah, give, save, Uh, spend. Yeah, spend. Yeah, live, spend, whatever. And but when and you obviously have you know when you're kids you have jars for that sort of thing. But how old were you when you first had um like when did you start contributing towards like 
not just a savings account, but kind of more investment retirement. At what age did, did you begin doing that? What age do you plan to do that for your kids? I'm just asking, cause like our 15 year old, she's had the jars forever and had a, has had a car savings in a, in a, in a bank forever, but she has her first job. Now we just took her down to Wells Fargo and got her first checking account and savings account besides that. So I'm just curious, like, cause I know like the, the we, we went through financial peace university and it changed our, our marriage changed our life. Yeah. We, we went that through that 14 years ago, 14 years ago. Oh, wow. Yeah. We were not given those tools, uh, at all. Uh, I mean, good examples, loving parents, tried hearts, but like, it was like, this is a paradigm shift for yeah. us. Um, so we tell everybody to go through it. And I always tell like our church, like well, get your priority in our church. Yeah, yes. We, we talk about it all, the all the time. It's always being offered. Mm-hmm. And, and we always say like, go through it when you're a teenager. Cause that's such a setup for success in life. Yeah. But what age did you begin besides just like a, a jar in your living room that was moving towards a, something you could buy, like actually starting to invest in that way? Yeah, well, saving up for our car was big. So after 16, beyond that, mom and dad opened up a mutual fund for us. So they funded some of that. Some of our like birthday money and things would go into it. But mostly they helped put a little bit of money in each year. And with, they started that probably when I was 16 or 17. But I remember sitting down with them every year and they would get it out and show me, okay, here's compound interest. Here's what it's doing. Wow. The more you can, And I could contribute if I wanted. And then I'd say once I left college, it was all on my own for sure. Uh, but they did open up a mutual fund for me. And even, even kids that work, to the extent that they work, we worked a ton as teenagers. But even looking to say, okay, could you open up a Roth IRA even for your kids starting young? You would probably have to contribute some depending on what the, the limit is. I think it's $7,500 you have to earn taxable income. Um, but if a parent wants to do that and go even a step further, you could totally do that and count that as earned income and open up a Roth IRA. But because it, but you guys it, always give out those fund. statistics about like buying cigarettes and what that leads to over like 20 <laughs> years of buying cigarettes. Like that was the most shocking thing in, in the financial piece for me is like that original if you did that, if you start saving for from when you're 20 or when you start saving when you're you know 13, if you bought cigarettes and or if you put that money towards mm. an investment account, it's like a staggering how different the outcomes are. Oh, yeah, it's wild. Math is just so fascinating. I'm probably like kind of nerdy in that way, but I'm like, <laughs> but you do use cigarettes. And that's one of the things about uh, even more than just, just the small purchases of like, don't get a coffee or don't buy cigarettes or whatever. But looking at a bigger picture to say, okay, what if you had, you didn't have a car payment? What if you didn't have $500 leaving a month to a car payment? What could you do Mm. uh, if you invested a car payment? I mean, you take the bigger parts. That's why I love getting people or helping people get out of debt because their income comes in and you can do so much with it versus it going 18 different directions in bills. And so what can you do? The power of having your income to be able to give it, save it, invest it, all of that is, is huge. And so the numbers just skyrocket. Um, it's, it's pretty, it's pretty crazy. And obviously it's a part of the baby step. So it's very clearly out there for anybody who wants to look into this at Ramsey solutions and all, you know, the zero, you guys have so many great resources that uh, zero budget. What's that website? Zero. Yeah. The, uh, every dollar is the budgeting app. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. There you go. And, uh, and, and yet I think there's a lot of people who, who think like, you know, when it, when it comes to my kid in college and, and that sort of thing, what is a strategy that you mm. encourage for parents? Like, you know, obviously it's, it's one of the baby steps, but is it better for kids to have to work and contribute towards their college? Is it better like, with, with the entitlement if you can, and is it preferable for the parents to pay for that entirely? What do you, what's your opinion on that? Sure. Well, my blanket statement always is if you don't have the money to pay for your kid's college, you are not a bad parent. Hmm. There's a level of, I have to pay for my kid's college. No, you don't. No, you don't. This whole student loan debacle, it's unbelievable to me because if you make choices and help your child make choices, say you have no money to help with them, you can still guide them and help them choose wisely. Hmm. If you stay in state, go to a community college, scholarships and grants and work, you can still go to school in 2021 debt-free. It takes a lot of work, a lot of intentionality, but you have to make smart choices. Mm. And as a parent, you can help guide that wisdom with your 18-year-old. And so that's a gift, let alone. Now, if you're in a position that you don't have debt, you have an emergency fund, you're taking care of your retirement, then the next step is contributing to kids' college. So getting this, getting really tactical, but a ESA is an educational savings account and it grows tax-free. That's a great college vehicle option for saving. Mm. 529 as well. So I do encourage parents, if they're at that place, that's a huge blessing to give your kids. If you're able to pay for their college, I think that that's great. Some parents, my parents paid for our college and the rule was we had to stay in state, go to a public university and graduate in four years. So if we went four and a half years or longer, we had to pay for that. 
and we're in Tennessee. And so I remember thinking, you know, I want to go to Auburn. I want to go do something different. And her dad was like, all right, well, we're in Tennessee. So look up the cost of the University of Tennessee and the, and then the tuition of out of state for Auburn, whatever the difference is, you got to pay for it. And I saw it. I was like, go Vols. I'll, I'll, I'll go to UT. I'll go to UT. It's fine. <laughs> but that's so, that's so helpful because I think you think, oh my gosh, I'm going to pay for college. But to have like boundaries and kind of regulations, so to speak, with that, that's so wise and so helpful to hear. Like you can say, I'm going to pay for college, but da 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 here in, within, within this um, arena. That's really helpful. Yeah. And I think the character of your kids is so, it's so huge, right? When you're nurturing them spiritually, you're teaching them, you're showing them how to do life well. Yeah. I think money is one of those that will come naturally, right? I mean, the, the, you have to know the ins and outs and the X's and O's of how to do money, how to avoid debt and how to do a budget. I mean, there's levels of that. Yes. But again, money, it's so behavior driven. Like it is so who we are. And when you can raise kids that are making wise decisions in life, money comes. So, so I wouldn't be fearful as a parent to pay for their college. I don't mm-hmm. think that's going to screw up and spoil a child automatically. Uh, if you decide to pay for their car when they're 16 and not make them pay for it, I think it's going to be okay. I think that there's, again, there's deeper issues, character issues there that some parents um, don't always happen to. I don't know if that makes sense, yeah. but I don't think you can ruin a kid by one or two purchases. I think when it's a uh, a habit that that's all they know, mm, probably a red flag. But mm. if other things have been in place to that point, giving them a gift of that does not squash their work ethic or who they are. That's so But good. I do think it's really important that parents know that far more than what they're teaching their kids through their words, the example is even more important. Because, you know, a- apart from just like it's the adage of it's, it's caught, not taught so that they're, they're listening to what you say, but they're watching what you do. Yeah. And I think that speaks more, more so than just anything you're going to try and give them as far as a paradigm. Oh, huge. That's one thing too, of, you know, as parents, Winston and I have been, have been aware of this. Like when we say no to something, if we're like, okay, we can't go on this trip this year, we're going to say no, or I want this level car, but we're going to go here, whatever it is. I want to bring my kids in those conversations. So they know mom and dad have boundaries. Mom and dad have limits. You may not understand the struggle right now, but we're making this decision. We really want to go there. Like mom really wants that purse. (laughs) I would rather have that purse. But right now I'm not going to buy that one. I'm going to buy this one over here. But just so you know, like I have a want that I'm not fulfilling because of financially where we are. And that's a limit and a boundary. But bringing them in to your point um, gosh, I think it's so, so, so important. Yeah. And it's funny to think about, like, even just like people will come in and be like, I'd love to buy that book, but I, I can't, I can't afford it. Or I, you know, we, the way that you charge for financial peace university, we've had pushback from people before who are like, ah, oh, it's $99 church should be doing that for free. And it's like, well, you have a thousand dollars in your pocket right now. Hmm. And people go, no, I don't. It's like, pull out your iPhone. That's a thousand dollar device. You found a way because mm-hmm. it mattered to you. Mm-hmm. And we, we invest in what matters to us. And so I, I think it's brilliant that people have to have some skin in the game because it's far easier to walk away from a small group when it's just, there's no buy-in. Yeah. And when there is skin in the game, the attrition level, it, it, it's going to be far less, not imperfect, not perfect, but it's going to make a difference. And so for people to invest in resources like this book, like FPU, it, it's going to make them actually see dividends because they have to, they have to buy in. Yeah. Oh, it's so, so true. Yeah. I mean, like, yeah. How many, yes, I want to be generous and all of that. But when you say something's a priority in my life, you have to make it that. And I think about giving for this. I talk to so many people and say, oh, I really want to give. But when I get down to the bottom of my budget, I don't have any money to give. I'm like, yeah, that's because your budget is upside down. Right. So are you paying for Comcast and not giving? Like, Hello. what are your, what are your priorities though? Really? If that yeah. is something you want to do, do it or saving. I really want to save. We just don't have money to save. Well, what else are you buying during the month? I mean, yeah. it is like you have to get to that visceral H&M, point. H&M, H&M got paid. And you know <laughs> what I mean? Like the, the uh-huh. things that we, that we want to get, those things get paid. Yes. It, it, my, we, there was someone, I can't remember who it was. So I'm not going to quote them right. But they said, show me your checking account and I'll show you your heart. Dang. Burn. Show I think, me where was, you, I think yeah, Jesus, when, I think Jesus might've said that. Did he? <laughs> I mean, essentially, right? <laughs> He's somewhere in the New Testament. Where your for treasure sure. is, there your heart is. Where your heart is, there you go. Yeah. So oh, we, we found it. There's the quote you were looking for. His name is Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. Uh, that one, that one. <laughs> now, I do want to talk about this because I know you're a three on the Enneagram, and that's what I am. So I'm very curious because Jenny's a nine. So I'm curious what Winston is. Oh, uh, Winston is a hardcore five. 
Okay. Because oh. I have seen Me a lot of the three Gager. nine combos. Okay. Yep, he is a, uh, yeah, he's a five. It's so funny. We did, we've done so many checklists and stuff with the Enneagram yeah. reading. And he says yes to every five. He's like, yes. But he's a five wing four. So he he has he has way more emotion than I think the average five. So he's he's artistic and does music and all of that. So he's like an artistic five. That's amazing. That's and so you're amazing. three seven. Is that what you? No, well the wing three. is. I want to be a seven. Oh, I'm a three. A seven. Yeah, I wing four though. Mm. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. So we wing together. Which you is interesting. wing together. That's we amazing. wing together. That's adorable. Um, <laughs> so, so love language. <laughs> Is he named after Winston Churchill? Where does that family, does that a family name? He's not. No, it was a, you want to know the real story? Yes. It's, it, his mom's probably going to listen to this and laugh so hard. <laughs> so they had him in the hospital in March, March 16th is his birthday. And they're watching March Madness. And there was a player, I think from Kentucky. And his name was Winston. And his dad was like, man, that's a good name. Winston Cruz. So that's it. That but his middle name. His middle name is Kerr, which is his mom's maiden name. So Winston Kerr Cruz. It's like the best name ever. That's a really <laughs> tough name. It's a very good name. And you guys have good kids' names too. I was just looking at the list. Uh, Amelia, Caroline, and Charles. All They all yeah. feel like they could be episodes of like Downton Abbey or The Crown or something. You have good, good British kind of sounding names. I mean, you guys are self-described hillbillies. So, I mean, you've gone very posh and upper crust on the <laughs> Winston we went, we went and bougie. Amelia. <laughs> we went British bougie. bougie. British bougie. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. That's what, amazing. What, what could be like the hillbilly bougie? How could you combine that? Hill bougie. Hill bougie. Hill bougie. Hill bougie. Hill bougie. Very good. Bougie uh, belly. So, but I, I brought that up the Enneagram because I was going to get at, you talk about a whole new way of assessing your personality, and that is the seven different money tendencies, which is cool because it's, it's again, another way to kind of, and I love this book. This book, you have so many different areas where yeah. people can take tests, get assessments, you know, and uh, so yeah, kind of maybe walk us through those, uh, those, those categories of the tendencies of money. Yes. Yeah, so one is spender versus saver. So naturally, are you a spender? Are you naturally a saver? And I'll say on all the tendencies, neither one is right or wrong. And the extremes can be unhealthy, but neither one's right or wrong. So mm. saver versus saver. So I'm a natural spender. What are you guys? I'm just curious. I, I, I really even try, I cannot figure that out because I feel like I'm a, right down the middle on that one. Yeah, yeah you could be. Yeah. yeah. On the spectrum, yeah. you can be for sure. What would you put yourself? I feel like growing up, I was more of a saver. And then I feel like after getting married, I feel like I've become more of a spender. Yeah, you're spender, not usually yeah. the one bringing up saving. That's usually me. Yeah. There you go. We're having spender. a fight. We're having a moment here. Mate, that's a moment. No, give, us, I'm a give us a second. A <laughs> Rachel, uh, the another reason why you brought, we brought you here yes. is... We have a lot <laughs> getting of questions. Getting to the point. <laughs> no, but this is good. And this I can just so listen good. to it. I can tell right now our pod, the odd podcast audience are being blessed because the, the reason we put this where we did in the year is because everyone around the new year has a felt need of this. And I just feel like people are, this is a struggle this, that if they yeah. can win this area. Oh yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Money is no, for sure. Another spectrum is things versus experiences. So when you spend money, would you rather spend it on experiences or things? And so for me, I'm, I'm an experience. I love going to the zoo or going out to a nice dinner where Winston is more things. So he's like, if I'm going to work and make money and buy something, I want to be able to reuse it over and over again. And that I want that quality of life there uh, where I will do more experiences. What about you guys? Definitely uh, things for me. Thanks. Sure. Yeah. No, but I love experiences, I like but I would say I, I gravitate too, towards things. You're so good at planning vacation. Like, I feel like you're right in the middle. There you go. I don't See, really you're, know yeah, you're busting me. all the theories. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a category <laughs> killer. <laughs> But, but but like you say in the book, it's in asking the question, you start moving towards the solution. Yeah. So even yes. just asking this question and assessing yourself, Socrates said, know yourself. So even yes. just like the exercise that people are going to find going through this and at the, um, at the last chapter, there's really incredible, I don't want to spoil it for people, but. I would just say, don't buy the yeah, Kindle version. It. This would not be great oh, for Kindle because there's. Yeah. I think people writing, need yeah. to mark this up and get this out. Yeah. And it needs to be almost like um, uh, something they could go back to after six months of trying and applying, and then read and retake it. And you're going to find the place where you can, you know, it's going to be really good. Yeah. Well, thank you. Well, yeah. And out of this, and the tendency specifically for that section, I wanted just to give burbage because I know Winston and I have had moments where we just miss each other. I'm like, why did you do that? With what? What? And now I can say, okay, because he's more scarcity mindset and I'm more abundance or 
Um, he is more safety driven and I'm more status, whatever it is. It now just gives me verbiage to understand, okay, that is why you do the things you do. So the yeah. seven money tendencies part of the book was fun because it so just helpful. kind of breaks down and it gives you empathy for other people in your life, whether it's your parents or your friends or your your spouse, whoever, you're like, okay, that is why they're making this decision. Now I can kind of pinpoint And that why. was number five. You just gave safety versus status, which we skipped over four, which is quality. Oh, sorry. No, yeah. no, no. I'm just making sure if the OCD of us can get it. <laughs> <laughs> quality or quantity? Yeah, I'm definitely quality. Okay. I'm quantity. I would rather have 15 pairs of earrings than one like nice pair. <laughs> yeah. I'm, what are you? Oh, yeah. I probably am the same. Quantity. But you have also become super minimal in your clothing. Like her clo her side of the closet has so many few, but she's kind of wears them more consistently. Well, if I could wear one thing every day of my life, I would do that. Well, <laughs> and that's the thing about quantity. And I talk about the ends of the spectrum because for me, I don't know if you relate to this, but I can find that I will cope with spending because I can just justify a purchase where I'm like, oh, it's just a $15 sweater off Amazon. It's okay. Holy. But I'm like, why am I doing it? Like, why am I causing that? I don't need another sweater. So I went through a minimalist kick. I write about it in the book, actually. Oh, and I got rid of so much because I just found what I will spend yeah. and I will justify purchases for that level of coping because it feels good. Yeah. It, that adrenaline hits and that dopamine and it, oh, it just feels good to buy. Right. And I'm like, why? During the pandemic for me, especially, I would just, guys, I was so bad. And I finally stopped myself. I was like, why am I buying all this? And I'm like, because I'm bored. Yeah. I'm like, why am I okay with not being bored? I'm like, because I don't want to sit with all my thoughts from my last counseling well, session. I don't want right? to feel, I don't wanna feel my like, feelings. <laughs> I'd rather eat them or retail or therapy. Or buy something. I know, but it's real. The it's emotion real. of it is and there for is sure. So to know that for me is big. And so status versus safety is another one you said. Um, six. Yeah. Okay. Oh, shoot. I'm bouncing around. I don't no, have my good. notes in front of me. Good. Am Number I on six, the right? Yeah. Am abundance. I on the right? Yes. Abundance versus scarcity. Yeah. So where you naturally lean, you know, glass half full, glass half empty. And Winston, I not to pick on him by any means because he would say it if he was sitting right here. But as a five, an Enneagram five, the Enneagram helped with us. Fives are naturally more scarcity mindset. Mm. They they reserve energy. They reserve resources. I mean, they pull in yeah. and observe and figure out what they will give where I'm just kind of like gates wide open. Oh, it'll be fine. There's always more. Right. It's fine. We That's can find another time. That's the secret seven. Coming. There's the secret seven coming out. Yep. Let's have a party. I yep. I have it. I have it in there. Okay. And then number seven. Is that the giving one? Yes, that's it. Okay, so giving, you're either naturally a planned giver or a spontaneous giver. And so, again, planned, neither one. Spontaneous. Yes, there you go. Yes. How, where where, where are you guys at on that one? Yeah, I'm spontaneous. I will hear about something and I'm like, babe, cash out the 401k. Like, totally. give it all to them. Give it all to them. They're doing yes. incredible work. Oh, we wouldn't have a house. <laughs> we wouldn't have cars. Jenny would just be like, I just met someone who's hurting. And I know. Yeah. It's all gone. I'm like, well, we've been planning and working towards this. We have an entire amount set aside. This was, this was, yes. I, so that's like very stressful for me. So funny. I know. Well, we've learned. We'll, we have our plans giving. Cause I do, there's a level, which I can appreciate of, again, the way we view it all, it's God's. And so I'm like, Hey, if I'm managing this for God, I'm going to make sure what I'm giving to it is well, it's a good investment. Like I don't want to spend more time on my actual, actual investments than I do my giving. Like I mm. want to dive in and know what I'm giving to. And so Winston's good at that. Like he's so good. So we have our plans giving, but we have like a little line item for spontaneous giving. But see, that's that cool because that, that makes it, it. planned spont plan spontaneity. And yeah. that doesn't stress me out at all. It's like, hey, let's set us, <laughs> if you want to be spontaneous, let's set aside and plan for the spontaneity. And that's the, that's the real power of all this is that ability to give like no one else. That is, it's not a shtick and it's not a tagline. It is the end result yeah. of, of living like no one else. Yeah. And that means going to the movie theater with your mom while she's stealing popcorn. You know, it's God bless her, <laughs> which is very funny she to me. She still does. <laughs> she still does. There's a lot. There's a lot of Sharon stories I could write in there. Oh, <laughs> really my great. Gosh, I love it. I would like to hear a little bit more about your mom. I feel like we, the world knows your dad so much, you know, but I'm sure the unsung hero in, oh. in this is, is your mom. Yes, we love mom. She's a one on the Enneagram. Mm. And she is the, she grew up on a farm in East Tennessee and kind, kind, but strong. That's how I would label my mom. Like when people meet her, like, oh, Sharon, because she's kind of, you know, she still kind of has her Southern accent. She's really sweet, but she has her convictions and her strength. And I really appreciate that. Now that I've gotten older, even, I'm like, she balances the two so beautifully. I think sometimes I can go strength too, too much sometimes, you know, or, oh, it's so loud 
but she does it in such a beautiful pairing. Mm. And she's the only person that can be married to Dave Ramsey. Let me tell you that. Wow. <laughs> We're like, Mom, you're a saint. I love your it. Dad, dad is though, too. But, your dad, yes. though, I mean, he's an inc- there's no one like him. Mm-hmm. Um, never had the chance to meet him, but I've listened to him so much and followed along and had my financial life changed and, and spiritually touched by him. Yeah. I mean, mm-hmm. when he gets up on that platform and he gives this stuff, he has such a he's such a uh, ability through the, his vulnerability and his yeah. own mistakes and shame, but then it really does get to the heart. Um, when I, it's funny, you mentioned about pandemic spending and just, feeling your emotions was like, ah, Jenny's like, what'd you do? I bought a ping pong table today. It's like, just why we, do we, does anybody want to? doesn't matter. I just, <laughs> I needed to buy it. I found the best one. I watched three hours of YouTube videos to oh, figure it out. Man. But there went through a, a kick where I, was, I had your dad's face on my iPhone wallpaper <laughs> oh, because you no, know, I did it. It helped me so much. Cause I was like, whenever I would like go to my phone to like make a bad decision just for what it was like, I seen your dad's face, like it calmed me down. So <laughs> Yeah. He's it's your accountability. Right he there. was my digital exactly. accountability exactly. partner. He's like, it's no, so sir, funny. you shall not. I was like, all right, fine. Like I'll... you pick up his phone thinking it's going to be a picture of me or the family. And it's like, no, nope, Dave, Dave Ramsey. Ramsey. For a while. Because <laughs> then I was like, okay, I'm not buying something. I'm going to put something into the Charles Schwab account. That's the, instead. Uh, so. It's so funny. I forgot yeah. about so that. My digital That's accountability great. partner. But um, oh, yeah, wow. so uh, one one thing I did I did want to come back to is, is and this was a touching part to me, is the, the, the role that dreams play in savings because you talk about um and i i highlighted it here because i didn't want to miss it uh you talk about how a lot of people think about you know not savings is a big problem because you're not going to have anything if the crisis hits which is powerful but then you say and I, i love this quote not having savings is also a warning sign of a second problem that you're not tuned into your dreams most people don't think about how deeply connected saving and dreams are Wow. if you're not saving it means you're not working towards any dreams and I just think that's so powerful. You're saying like, it's not just that you're not going to have money for the, you know, the roof going out or the car breaking down, but it just means you're probably not dreaming enough. And I think that's wow, really powerful. That's beautiful. Yeah. I mean, the basics of saving your emergency fund and retirement, that's all there. But beyond that, we think, okay, well, why do I have trouble putting money away? Why do I want to spend it in the present right now, right when I have it? And it's probably because you're not looking to the future to say, okay, where are we going? Where are we going as a family? What are we doing? And Winston and I will have these date nights probably twice a year where we'll have dinner. We'll just say, if money was off the table, where do we want to be in three years? What, what do we, what do we, want? you know, we, we even say the, the ages of our kids. Okay, well, Amelia's going to be this age and all this, she'll be in this grade and, you know, we'll go through it. And it just makes you think, okay, do we want to take two trips to the beach in three years? What, what do we want to do? What do we want to do with our family? And for me, I'll say as a natural spender, this helps me. If I have a goal, if I know I'm going to somewhere, I'm doing something, I'm like, yes, it, I, I will sacrifice. And I was like, yeah, I'll say no to that thing because I know where we're going. And couples that don't do this together is really dangerous. I think we'll all have our separate dreams you know, Winston would live in a duck blind in Arkansas if he could. Gotcha. I would live in Manhattan. And like, yeah, so we're naturally going to have well, our that's own That's hill bougie. He yeah, brought the hill, it. you brought the bougie. So there you <laughs> that's go. It, that's it. Yeah. But, but so we're all going to have our own passions, right? We're all uniquely created. And so not the, to dismiss that, but to have shared dreams. And as a couple working together as a team is so crucial. We talked about the money fights and all of that together because money is in the, gets in the middle of, of couples. It's right there. And I'm like, you have to take it and place it across the room, right? You like look at it over there and say, okay, there's the problem. You're not the problem. I'm not the problem. That's the problem. Yeah. And so being able to have that visual first and foremost, and then to say, okay, let's look at money as a tool, as a tool to create a life that we're called for. Money is a tool to create a life that blesses our family and blesses others. So what do we do with that thing over there? It's across the room. It's not in between us. It's over there. But how can we use that in our lives and what can we do together? And even just those simple conversations, how many couples don't have that? Mm. They run on two separate tracks, they're Mm. on two separate lives. And I'm telling you, coming together and being unified on a subject that is so important. When you get married, it says you are one. You are one in every aspect of your life, including Mm. your money. And so being that team is so crucial. And so again, not just the tactical side of it, but the dreaming side. And looking Mm. to the future, where do you wanna go as a family? What do you wanna do? What do you wanna give to? What are the things you wanna accomplish? And being aware once you, and that's what's so brilliant about the way the book starts, like, hey, what's your family of origin? What's your style? Mm. What's that? And that's not, like the Enneagram says, you know, there's not, there's, there's nine normals. There's not one way that's right. And so like acknowledging, hey, the way Jenny sees money, the way Winston sees money, the way Rachel and Levi see money, like that's that's not better or worse. It's just what we are. Yeah. So now when we come together, 
We're not, we're not going to be wasting all the time and energy triggering the deep wounds that causes the lashing out in the fight. Cause we're not saying the way you see it's wrong. It's just, well, here's how I see it now. What, what's our vision together. Yeah, and I think good. for the person who's listening to this going, well, that's great. You know, it's your dad's a millionaire, Rachel, you grew up blah, blah, and whatever the pushback might be. You don't understand. I'm a single mother. I've got this. It's not all these things work on small scales too. Mm. And you talk about this $8 million gas station, you know, employee. And I've heard your dad a million times say the, the millionaire next door is, this is a school teacher. These, these are people with, with, with fixed incomes. This is not about quantity. Yeah. It's about right decisions over time. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. We laugh all the time and say, we don't sell microwaves. We sell crock pots. It takes, it takes a while. And so, yeah, no matter where you are, no matter where you are, if you are one of the 78% of Americans that live paycheck to paycheck, if you are one of the 40% that can't cover a $400 emergency in cash, I mean, there is real, real struggle right now. And, and the thing with that is that people lose hope. They lose hope that it can get better. And the moment you are sick and tired of your situation, you say, okay, you know what? I am living paycheck to paycheck. I may not be making a huge income, but this is not working. That level of pain can be a teacher. I don't think pain has to be your only teacher, but it's a thorough teacher yeah. where you can take that and say, you know what? I'm going to have hope that I'm going to change, which is going to be uncomfortable. If you start to change the way you've been doing stuff, even if it's not right and you're changing, it, there's friction. It's not fun. It's very uncomfortable. The moment you say, I'm going to do something different, because you have hope that what is going to happen in the future is better than your present. And people lose that hope though. They lose that hope. And I, and that's what makes me sad. That's what breaks my heart and all of this. I'm like, it's, it can be hopeless and it doesn't have to be. Wow. Uh, it, it is so, there's more scriptures on money than heaven and hell combined. Wow. I mean, it is in there. Even just opening up God's word. I'm like, it is so in there. The borrower is slave to the lender. When you're in debt, you feel that. You feel like, gosh, something else owns my paycheck yeah. and it changes the way that you view money. In the house of the wise are stores of choice food and oil. A foolish man devours all he has. Wise people say, I mean, it's all in there. And so taking that and saying, I'm going to use this as a roadmap, it will. It, and it takes time. There's going to be mistakes. There's going to be setbacks. Life's going to happen. But over time, when you're diligent to say, God, I'm going to use the resources you've given me, and I'm going to manage them as best as I can this side of heaven, there, there's something about that. There's a level of ownership that you can take over that. Yeah, Jeez. so hopeful and inspiring. Don't be the rats. To, don't be the, the drowning rat. Yeah, you can go. But see, you said, I don't want to spoil it. That's a great thing. But the power of hope. You were like, wait, don't be a drowning rat. <laughs> that was a shocking study. And those scientists. It was, it was, it was in the book. Those scientists book. <laughs> should be ashamed, ashamed of themselves. But uh, but the rats that had uh, been stressed and, and they lived so much longer because they had hope that they could get out of it. So you do yeah. give people hope well. Yeah. Yeah. Gosh, Rachel, thank you for your time. Thank you for this and, and the impact and glad to start up a new friendship yeah. with you. Absolutely, guys. Well, I said we've seen each other, yeah. but now together. Oh, no, I know. Well, I'm so thankful for you guys. I shared off the podcast, but your story, it just, it changes and inspires and gives hope on a, on a such, such a deep level to people. So I'm appreciative of all you guys give and share and the podcast and all you do. So I'm, I'm a fan of you guys and thankful. So thankful for y'all. Thank you, Rachel. Amazing. 